Hello, everybody. I'm going to just ask my speakers to come up for this next session. Uh, I hope everyone is uh, nourished in mind from your conversation and body from your sandwiches. Um, we had a uh, really intense morning. Uh, I think I'm happy to tell you we have an equally intense afternoon. What we are trying to do is help people understand the richness and complexity of these issues, these issues that we started examining very much from uh, the personal point of view, uh, with help from Star and with Jeremy, uh, that we've sort of zoomed out uh, with Jonathan's contribution and the contribution from the wonderful activist lawyers right before lunch. Um, we have now brought in uh, three good friends, uh, academics, lawyers, researchers, activists, to really think about this question of the broader context around freedom to innovate. So these are folks who are not necessarily just going to dive into the intricacies of CFAA or uh, DMCA. They're going to talk about this sort of larger framework um, of sometimes some very tricky questions about uh, what happens when we try to protect the freedom to innovate and where do we find ourselves tripping over these lines of one fashion or another. Um, but we're very, very lucky uh, to have with us uh, Alvaro Bedoya, who's with us from um, uh, Georgetown Law, and he's gonna be talking about some issues of, of privacy. Uh, we have uh, Carrie uh, Carajalios, did I get even close? Um, who's from UIUC. She's a professor there as well as a social computing researcher. Uh, and that has all sorts of interesting implications these days as people try to do research on social computing. Uh, but our first speaker uh, is a very dear old friend of mine. Uh, she works for W3C. She's probably best known as an activist, lawyer, and technologist. Uh, so I'm gonna start by uh, giving the floor to Wendy Seltzer. Wendy, happy to have you here. Thank you so much, Ethan, um, and thank you all. Uh, it's really, really difficult to, to follow the, uh, the stream of conversations that began this morning. Uh, Star and Jeremy gave us really great individual reflections on how, how the law works in practice. And uh, I think uh, what I want to do is to uh, address some of the, how do we, uh, address that chilling effect that the law uh, is having on innovative activity? How do we preserve the, the freedom to innovate by looking at the places where the law is going wrong? And how do we fix the law? How do we operate on the institutions that we have uh, available to us uh, as academics, as lawyers, as citizens uh, to take some of the hot air out of the room, uh, take some of the chilling effects uh, out, and return us to a, uh, an innovative climate uh, uh, for activity. Uh, so uh, a core aspect of the uh, freedom to innovate uh, is the freedom to fail. So here's a cheesy motivational poster with a quote from uh, Thomas Edison, but it captures uh, a real piece of the experimental process. Uh, which is that, you know, you haven't failed. Uh, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Anyone who's an entrepreneur, anyone who's an experimental scientist, anyone who's an innovator in technology uh, or in any other field has had hundreds of failures before they've found what works. And the freedom to experiment, the freedom to do things that break, the freedom to build clocks that don't tick uh, before you figure out the way to do the wiring right uh, is critical to getting uh, to uh, the innovation, getting over that hump uh, and building something that works and adds value to the world. And uh, so we see that in studies of entrepreneurship. Richard Florida, when he looks at why the United States has uh, a culture of entrepreneurship and why Silicon Valley has uh, so many innovative companies, says it's because we're willing to forgive failure because we have reasonable bankruptcy laws that let people start again after their businesses tank. Uh, it's because we have uh, a normative culture where we say not, you failed, you've shamed yourself and your family, you'll never work again, but rather, 
sorry that didn't work, let's learn from the failure and uh, try again. We have uh, see people starting up fail fests where they celebrate the failures and point to them and uh, show, use them as examples of not, you know, what a terrible piece of sloppy code you wrote, but how can we look at that sloppy code and figure out are there debugging tools that would help us to reach it sooner? Are there uh, programming tools that would help us to build better software next time? Uh, and so uh, a problem with overly harsh law uh, is that it doesn't allow those opportunities for experimentation. Instead of saying, oop, you stepped over the line, please don't do that again, it says, you stepped over the line, uh, that's uh, a $500,000 fine, that's uh, a jail penalty. That's not uh, encouraging a culture of innovation, uh, that's chilling. Uh, and anyone who uh, lives in Boston uh, or nearby knows chilling. Uh, we, had <laughs> uh, we had a chilling winter uh, last year, uh, but um, we need instead from, from our laws uh, is a better thermostat. Um, so uh, a thermostat uh, works um, by uh, setting the temperature and then trying to adjust uh, to that temperature, but uh, you can't uh, tune it precisely to the set point, so the temperature goes up a little bit above the uh, desired temperature, uh, the ther furnace shuts off, the temperature cools down a little bit below the temperature, the furnace turns back on again. Um, and if instead of a, a reasonable thermostat, uh, you had uh, a block at the top end that said the temperature must not go above the set point, uh, you'd be unable to regulate uh, the temperature of your home. Uh, and that's what I think the law is doing to uh, our innovative opportunities by saying, you know, you must stop when you get to the point of uh, interfering with somebody's uh, copyright management system, not even interfering with somebody's copyright, but interfering, uh, circumventing the system of code that somebody has set up that they are able to claim uh, protects a copyrighted work of software, even if in fact it's hiding the lying uh, emissions control software of their, their automobiles, uh, even if it's in fact uh, hiding the uh, improperly audited software of their voting machines, um, by uh, saying you, you, might, you may not go there, you must not go there, uh, we're forbidding the, uh, the exploration, we're forbidding the, the, the scientific uh, experimentation, and we're stifling not just the uh, creative experimentation, but we're holding ourselves back as a society from reaching um, any of these uh, new ideas. Um, and so, uh, uh, we, we've got this notion of deterrence <laughs> that uh, punishable by death and a $200 fine. <laughs> uh, so, but we're here in a university. Uh, we, we have an opportunity to think much bigger uh, and much better, and we have an opportunity to think about uh, how the laws are made and how we can change the laws. Uh, and so looking at these failures of the law, uh, let's take those as opportunities to, uh, uh, I don't want to say experiment because it's not uh, fair for us to talk about experimenting with the individuals who get caught up in the law. Uh, and so I uh, ask us, us, how can we, uh, as counselors, as academics, as, uh, as teachers, work with the law to uh, give ethical guidance to uh, people who are trying to uh, do experiments. Uh, how can we both explain what the law is and uh, help our students and colleagues and friends to know where the limits are uh, without uh, ourselves contributing to the chill, without making the law seem so scary that people are afraid to tread into experimentation, and yet without, on the other side, giving undue confidence and causing people to do things that are dangerous. Um, you know, as, uh, as, as lawyers and counselors and teachers, uh, we can't uh, take e either of those extremes. Um, and so uh, we need to both uh, work to um, give people good sound advice 
and also uh, support. Also, the support to challenge the laws where the laws are wrong, uh, support to rewrite the laws, to fix the laws, uh, to, to give uh, that greater opportunity uh, for uh, experimentation. So we need to work both in the halls uh, of MIT uh, and in the halls uh, of the Supreme Court uh, and other buildings in, in Washington and state capitals uh, to improve the law and our opportunities for uh, experimentation. And finally, in the spirit uh, in which Hal uh, started us uh, this morning, uh, appealing to witchcraft and uh, the opportunities to, to be a witch and to protect the, the witchery of, uh, of technology. Uh, here's uh, an older MIT hack uh, of a witch's hat on top of the dome. Let's all uh, preserve the opportunity to hack in that spirit of experimentation. Or um, do you want to let us go through three talks and then sort of do talk questions at the end? What, whatever your preference is. I, I think uh, if it's okay with you, let's, let's do three and then let's let folks uh, put, put questions to any of you. Sounds great. Awesome. Uh, so Carrie, are you up oh, next? Sure. Hello, can you hear me? Ah, okay, um, I'm Carrie Karahalios, I'm from Univers University of Illinois. I am um, a researcher in the computer science department um, where I adopt techniques from data mining all the way to techniques from the social sciences such as interviews. Um, I'm briefly gonna talk today about some of the uncertainty and inconsist inconsistencies that makes research difficult in the area of social computing. Um, I actually say I, I loved the talk earlier about difficulties in, in medical devices. I hadn't even imagined some of what was talked about there. Um, so I'm talking about my narrow domain here. So in my group, we've done a lot of studies where we collect lots and lots of data. Um, this particular study is an, this image is from a study where we wanted to look at whether or not social media connects rural and urban areas or whether or not it separates them, um, similar to what happened with the telephone many years earlier. And we found that social media did not really connect very well between urban and rural areas. To do this, we scraped Facebook, uh, sorry, we scraped MySpace again and again and again. Um, we had our IP addresses blocked. We just found new computers and kept going. Um, that was our, our model at the time. And this was 2008. And we didn't think anything of it. Um, a lot of the work that we've done since then is moving closer to some of the audit work that was described earlier. So for example, we're really interested in looking online and trying to see if there's any discrimination or discrepancies between um, fair housing, economic opportunities, um, different amounts of money um, going to different people, um, and price discrimination. And so in this vein of auditing, um, some colleagues and myself were sitting around a table one day uh, looking at the Facebook newsfeed. And we were wondering, my colleague Christian Sandvik had made this post about uh, big pens, and he just kept staying at the top of people's feet for weeks, and we couldn't figure out why this was. And we're like, you know, we're scientists, let's figure this out. So we were trying to come up with techniques for how we can make sense of this news feed and how we can help others make sense of the news feed. So we came up with several different approaches for our audit. Um, one of them is to get the code. Um, contacted Facebook, we were not gonna get the code from Facebook. Um, so we moved on. Um, another technique we explored was asking users. There's pros and cons to this. It can take a really long time. It also limits the number of participants you can have in the study. Um, another thing we can do is we can collect data manually. We can ask people to just write down their own data and just give it to us. Um, in fact, so that we wouldn't violate terms of service, a while back the NSF, the National Science Foundation, had asked us to create an application whereby we made a form where people could just directly copy everything from their Facebook page, like their name, their favorite music, type it directly into a form so that researchers could collect data and not violate terms of service. Um, people don't do this. Uh, we've tried, we've tried to do it in Mechanical Turk, people just don't do this. Um, another approach is to scrape everything. Uh, and as, if we've heard, as we've already heard today, 
Um, terms of service, CFA mix is very, very scary for researchers. Another approach is to use a sock puppet. A sock puppet is a, um, a technique whereby you create an identity um, and you make many of these identities and you curate these identities. So for example, let's say I want to do a study and I want to see if baseball players get more ads for soccer balls than non-baseball players. Um, so I can make 100 accounts on Google and every day make them go through a script where they see URLs about baseball and make another fake uh, 100 Google accounts where they go through knitting sites and compare and see what they get on their pages. Um, Facebook does not allow you to have, to create an identity that is not your own. Google does allow this for now. And again, this is cumbersome, requires lots of record keeping. Also, when you do create these identities, you have to curate them. So for many of these sites, nothing really much happens until you actually have these up for four months or so. So it takes a lot of work to maintain these. Another approach that we're trying to motivate for the moment um, is the collective audit. This idea of people coming together to audit. And this is still in the baby steps. Um, so I have to say, in our attempt to make sense of algorithms, terms of service probably was one of the biggest obstacles, or biggest walls, rather. And part of it is because we don't understand all the law. Um, just at lunch today, I got more information from the people at the table than I've gotten in the last two years, and it was amazing. So I'm really excited about this clinic. Um, so you've all seen terms of service agreements. Uh, the top one here is from Facebook. The bottom one is from Twitch. Uh, basically, they all talk about harvesting bots, prohibiting the harvesting of bots, robots, spiders, scrapers. Um, or any other automated means, which is left nice and vague. Um, some of these terms of service, as you can guess, have over 10,000 words. Not everybody reads them. In fact, like a service, a service such as Yik Yak, you never even, even have to log in. You can go directly, and because it's anonymous, you might be doing whatever you want and not knowing the terms of service exist underneath it. Terms of service are also subject to change. In fact, in one study that we did, when we started the study in the beginning, um, we, were, we did, went out of our way to keep up with terms of service. Nine months later, as we were completing the study, um, in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a researcher at Facebook, we were told we were no longer maintaining terms of service and we had violated them. Um, they supported the work, which was wonderful, but it's, we didn't even know that the terms of service had changed at that point. Companies are now trying to make it easier. They're trying to let you know, but it's not always, you don't always know when terms of service have changed. Um, we're also in many of these sites forbidden from reverse engineering something. If you want to figure out how an algorithm works, one approach is to reverse engineer. Um, and again, this is from the Twitch site over here where they explicitly forbid it. Um, so I mention this to students. Most students aren't aware that terms of service even exists. Um, in a computer science program, they take courses. We don't mention this at hackathons, um, and we have many hackathons with thousands of students a year. Um, many of faculty in data mining don't know that some of these exist. So the number one comment I get from students and faculty alike is, so what? Um, so it does have impact in some of my work, not just professionally, but also socially. So for example, um, if I don't follow terms of service sometimes, we can't get our work published. And what do I mean by this? So specifically, the ACM has some guidelines that you should follow. So the general moral imperatives of the ACM Code of Ethics state that violation of trade secrets in the terms of license agreements is prohibited by law in most circumstances. Even when software is not so protected, such violations are, not, are contrary to professional behavior. So they suggest that you follow terms of service. So what does this mean to a student? Um, I've been in, in panels, in conferences, where it just so happens that one person is very passionate about this and says, no, we cannot accept this paper because it violated terms of service. At the exact conference in a room next door for a different track, somebody's like, this is great work. It has to get out. So what if it violates terms of service? So there's very little consistency, and people don't know. So there's a lot of concern about the injustice in getting a lot of this work out. Um, and also the, just the fact that the ACM can make a claim like this and maybe should go a little bit further in qualifying it. Um, that said, there's many reasons to follow terms of service. And I'm not saying that this is a call to action for everyone to just go up in arms. Um, researchers generally respect the law, including trade secrets and intellectual property. Um, and the, many hold the utilitarian view that research practices following corporate terms will be good for industry academia relations and are likely to result in better long-term research projects. And that has happened as well, uh, which has led to other inequalities. Um, some cases, some research have collaborations with companies that others may not have. Um, so I mentioned unpublishable work. There's also a reputation of student and reputation of faculty. 
There's a data set called the T3 data set collected um, by a well-known university that scraped lots and lots of data from Facebook with the collaboration of the National Science Foundation and the university itself. Um, there were some concerns about this data set that um, ultimately affected the reputation of some of the researchers who are great researchers. Um, as a faculty member, I feel like it's my responsibility to protect the reputations of my students. Um, and so while I probably don't worry as much about myself, I do worry about my student getting a job. I worry about my student being able to even get that interview or being blackballed from the community because it is a small community. Um, fi finding employment and establishment is a concern. So let's say I scrape lots of Facebook data with a student and that student's dream job is at Facebook. In some cases this may help them if the work is good, but in some cases it might hurt them. Um, and finally, research funding. You know, a lot of academics get their money from the National Science Foundation. We get money from Google, we get money from Facebook, money from Intel. Um, we have to think about what we can do in order to get funding. Oftentimes when you file a grant with the National Science Foundation, you may, oh bless you, <laughs> thank you. Um, there are concerns, a grant, I have had a grant that um, has had concerns about the ethical issues of terms of service and me collecting the data that I need. And so if I need to get funding to publish my work, in some ways I feel like I'm bound to follow these patterns to walk through that maze so that I can get the funding that I need to do anything. And then yet some students still say, so what? I don't need to get funding, you have to get the funding for me. Well then, as already been mentioned, there's the CFAA. Um, this has criminalized several computer related acts. Um, certain uses of the CFAA have been denounced by security and discrimination researchers who have commented that we, would all, we could all go to jail for security research at any moment and a jury would happily convict us. Um, such scraping, I have to say, remains very common in the computer science world. Um, and we've spoken to many, many lawyers at the ACLU, at the EFF, who've actively told us not to scrape data. Um, they've told us that such scraping was almost certainly illegal under CFAA. Um, we've also been told that if we receive a cease and desist letter, we should stop. If we've had IP addresses blocked, we should stop, which was not what we were doing in 2008. Um, just to show you some of the, some of the diversity in opinions, um, this wonderful paper came out, well, it will be presented in February, but the researcher released it recently, Jessica Vitalk, uh, called, um, which addresses the ethical challenges, practices, and beliefs in online data, online data research community. And I just extracted a table from this because I thought it was interesting. So on the upper left-hand corner, you see things that researchers in three disparate fields agree on. And these researchers are information science, social science, and computer science. So people generally agree that you remove subjects from data sets upon request if they don't want to be in your data. Um, you ask colleagues uh, or IRBs about research. You share results with participants, and you think about edge cases outliers, so you don't release data whereby somebody might be easily identifiable. People generally agree, with a high variance, however, um, that you should use non-representative samples in your data because it's hard from a Twitter data set to make sure that you match a US demographic exactly, uh, that you remove unique individuals before sharing data, and that researchers can't collect large-scale online data if consent is required. It makes it hard. What's interesting, though, is what people disagree on with a very high variance. People generally disagree um, on whether or not to ignore terms of service when necessary, and it's unclear what when necessary means. There's a lot of um, diverse opinion uh, with respect to deceiving participants in studies, um, sharing raw data with key stakeholders, um, and whether or not it's even possible to obtain informed consent in large-scale studies. And we've also the controversy that came out of the Facebook emotion contagion study. Uh, but in social computing, we are doing some of these large-scale data uh, analyses as well as smaller-scale data. And we need to think about what it means um, as we collect our data and how we protect our participants. Which leads me to the next point that can build a wall around research, but and oftentimes almost certainly adds time to getting research out. And that's the IRB. Um, the IRB is necessary. It's very necessary. Um, this is a quote. Um, Sometimes with the best of intentions, scientists and public officials and others involved in working for the benefit of us all forget that people are people. They concentrate so totally on plans and programs, experiments, statistics, on abstractions, that people become objects, symbols on, on paper, figures in a mathematical formula or impersonal, subject, or impersonal subjects in a scientific study. This is from the Atlanta Constitution, 1972, in reference to the Tuskegee syphilis studies. Um, I don't want to go into the gruesome details of the studies. Suffice it to say, that um, 
600 men were enlisted in the study starting in 1932. By the end of the study in the 70s, um, 28 men were dead of syphilis, 100 were dead of related complications, 40 of their wives were infected, and 19 of their children were infected. Um, so IRB is important. It's meant to protect people. Um, and there's three guiding principles of the IRB that are derived from the Belmont Report. And the Belmont Report emphasizes respect for research participants, beneficence, and justice. So respect for participants means respecting their integrity, protecting your participants. Beneficence stresses that the, the benefits of the research should far outweigh the negatives of the research. And justice means that you should help everybody, and also everyone should be an equitable subject in the research study. So in taking this in the era of big data, it doesn't translate exactly. So for example, respect for research participants in the world of big data often means let's have informed consent. Um, but then how do I go about also, one of my jobs as a researcher is to protect those who can't make independent decisions. If I'm collecting a really large Facebook data set, how can I guarantee that I'm protecting everybody? How can I get everyone's informed consent? Um, in beneficence, oftentimes in the kind of work that we do, minimizing risks means um, providing anonymized data sets, providing confidentiality of data. But we all know that some data can be de-anonymized. Um, in the world of justice, we want equitable, equitable sampling of participants. And that can be really, really hard. We know that there's some constraints for people using Twitter. We know that there's some, some socioeconomic factors in who uses Facebook um, and who doesn't. And so even doing this research properly can be very, very difficult. And we have to show a lot of this to get through the hurdle of IRB, to pass IRB. Um, just to give you an idea, our group was the first group at the University of Illinois to try to put in a Facebook IRB, and it took us nine months to get it approved, back and forth in discussing it. It's gotten shorter since. Just to show you inconsistencies, in a project we were doing where we were collaborating with another university, we wanted to interview children with Asperger's that played World of Warcraft with their parents. We wanted to show how their experiences in World of Warcraft actually helped them socially outside of the game on the schoolyard. It took us six months to get IRB approval. It took our other institution two days to get approval, hence delaying a collaboration. Um, the reason we could not get approval was because somebody on the board felt that World of Warcraft could be violent and might make somebody violent. Um, these kids were already playing the game. We wanted to interview them about their experiences playing the game, and it delayed the work by six months. One thing I should also mention about IRB is that there's a lot of debate about ethical versus legal. There could be a lot of things that are ethical but illegal, a lot of things that might be legal but unethical. And so there's some um, disagreements about what is the purview of the IRB. Like, does the IRB have the right to stop you from doing something because you violate terms of service? And different IRBs are different. There isn't something set in stone here. And one of our problems is that we don't have a clear set of guidelines. So in our study, we ended up asking users, I mentioned um, six different approaches earlier. We asked our user, we created an interface, and basically we wanted to explore. We showed people what they could see in their feed, what they did see in their feed, and what they could have seen if they saw everything from all of their, from all of their friends. And I don't want to go into detail about this, but one of the things that's really exciting to me about this research is that people got at first, they were appalled that there was an algorithm behind the feed, and most people didn't even know there was an algorithm behind the, behind the Facebook news feed. And this was fall of 2013, uh, spring of 2014. Um, by the end of our study, though, they saw, wow, it's kind of necessary. There's no way I can read all of these posts. And in some ways, our findings actually help Facebook. Um, also, beyond that, what makes me really excited right now is our new work in showing how maybe we can use design to actually highlight algorithmic process at hand. How can we be designers and incorporate seamful design to actually embrace the seams in, in these um, interfaces rather than hide everything under the hood? Um, and so I'm going to end just by talking about studies where, um, as researchers, we really, really want to be able to do a lot of the work that we feel we can't do with respect to terms of service and CFAA. And a lot of this work comes from discrimination and bias. And one of my favorite projects that did not violate any terms of service was one by Latanya Sweeney. Um, and what she did was um, she got a huge corpus of names, some white, some black. She would put them in to a search engine, and she would look at um, the ads that came out by Google. So for example, the name Carrie Swigert came up with located um, Carrie Swigert found. Um, when Latanya Sweeney put in um, this name, um, Keisha Bentley, Instead, she got Keisha Bentley arrested. Um, what she did, actually, was very legit. She got over 1,000 names, and she did all of this by hand. Um, 
However, let's say somebody wanted to do something large scale, wanted to replicate this, wanted to try other different types of names. Um, you might have to violate some of these terms of service. Um, and you might want to see what's going on inside of some of these systems, inside of some of these algorithms. A snippet of code that I grabbed a while back um, that searched for people actually explicitly searched for skin tones of people of color. Um, do you want to see if code is racist? Do you want to see if code is ethical? Um, I already mentioned reverse engineering. Um, the folks at Volkswagen, the researchers, did not reverse engineer the system. They couldn't. And they looked at outcomes. And based on the outcomes, they figured out what was going on. Um, maybe we can be able to go delve a little bit further. Um, some other research by the amazing um, Crystal Wilson at Northeastern is looking at price discrimination, getting different prices on cell phones versus on a desktop, um, getting different prices if you're a member of a site versus not being a member of a site. It's exciting research, and people really, really want to know what's going on. Um, so I'm going to end um, by saying that research are, researchers are creative, and sometimes as designers, constraints do breed creativity. And we found that a lot of our work has has created new methodologies because of these blocks that were, or these walls that were put in front of us. But sometimes we don't need these walls. Sometimes it'd be nice to be able to climb over these walls. Um, maybe we should reassess IRB. IRB was designed over 30 years ago. And it's, again, it needs to be there. But how do we design it for the new research that we're doing today? Um, also, we need to understand the norms of our community. If people in computer science have one norm, people in social sciences and information sciences have another nor norm, instead of arguing with each other about who's right, we should be talking with each other and doing work together. Um, and finally, we need to work with policymakers and research organizations to allow researchers to explore scientific research areas, such as discrimination and bias. Um, again, one of the missions of the ACM is to ensure the public is well educated about computing technology. We need to help them do that. Um, and they need to listen to us. Um, there are ethical guidelines set by the AOIR, the Association of Internet Researchers. Um, they could go a bit further. Um, there's a journalistic code of ethics um, where journalists actually believe that we need to prioritize truth above all else. Do we need to incorporate some of that into our own research practice? But like many complex infrastructures, our algorithmic platforms reflect the influence of economic interests, empirical and design research, and competing fundamentalist foundational assumptions about collective living. If the best systems have achieved success through careful integration of such disparate approaches into the design process, certainly our research and our policies deserve the same approaches. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Hey guys, uh, my name is Al Robidoya, and I uh, run a think tank at Georgetown Law called the Center on Privacy and Technology. And uh, one of the things we do, actually, and I'm going to talk more about this later, is offer a uh, joint course with MIT, where we pair MIT students with uh, Georgetown Law students, and we challenge these teams to draft better privacy laws. So if anything I say is remotely interesting to you, you should take this course. Uh, Hal is one of the professors, Danny Weitzner is another one, uh, and we do it in the spring. Uh, and uh, uh, so anyways, uh, enough of that. Um, before this job, I uh, was chief counsel, so I was, I was basically the lead advisor to Senator Al Franken on privacy and uh, uh, security issues, uh, mostly privacy, and I also ran his subcommittee on privacy. And uh, that's where I learned a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk uh, about with you today. And I want to talk about three things. The first is um, uh, our foray into CFAA reform and what we learned from that. And one of the things I learned from that is how innovation, or I should say innovation in DC, uh, has, uh, in that term, has taken on a life of its own and that very powerful interests are using that term to justify what is a pretty broad uh, quashing uh, of 
pretty reasonable efforts to improve our privacy laws. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about is probably, I think, the most important thing is that you guys are the solution to this. And I want to talk about how you can be a part of that. So um, first of all, let's take a second to ask, you know, why in the world is a CFA so ridiculously bad? Uh, and I think you touched on this briefly. Um, there is almost no better brand in Washington than being tough on crime. And uh, it is very easy. It's getting a little harder. It's getting a little better. But it's very easy to pass a new criminal law. Um, so that's the first trend. Uh, the second trend is that we have a dearth of tech-savvy staffers and tech-savvy uh, uh, legislators. Again, that's getting a little bit better, but that is a problem. And you can see where in that soup of no one understands how the technology works, plus, yay, let's pass another criminal law, you get laws like CFAA. Obviously, I'm oversimplifying, but all of that contributes to it. So um, in 2011-2012, um, I was working for Senator Franken. I had a colleague on Senator Grassley's staff, Senator Grassley, a Republican from Iowa, and we put together um, an amendment that uh, um, there was this big tough on crime uh, um, update to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And so we got together and we said, okay, well, why don't we try to do something good here? And this was a couple years after the Lori Drew case, which some of you may have heard about. Um, and we said, why don't we just eliminate pure terms of service violations uh, from the grounds of what constitutes a CFA violation? So uh, uh, to state it more clearly, uh, if you Give your, someone else your Facebook password. If you are 17 and you're selling your knitted scarves on Etsy uh, and you have to pretend you're 18 years old uh, to do that. If you are um, you know, using Pandora in the wrong way, you are committing a terms of service violation and under the CFAA, under various interp some interpretations put forward by the Department of Justice, you are a criminal. Uh, you have committed a misdemeanor and if you, you know, cost someone about like 20 hours of sysadmin time, then you are a felon. Uh, and so uh, we wanted to just excise that little bit from the CFA. And we actually passed that out of committee. But once we passed that out of, so that's the first step, you know that when the bill comes to law thing, so like it was introduced, we brought it to committee, we passed it out of committee. Um, and that's when the lobbying started. Uh, uh, with an amendment in, in Washington, you can often get something done very quickly and kind of people's heads are spinning like what the heck just happened. Uh, and that's kind of what we did with the CFAA amendment. Uh, but once we passed that out of committee, um, everyone on the other side of this woke up and that's when the lobbying started. Uh, and there was a, a very concerted push by the administration to, uh, uh, um, in, their, in their words, I think, fix uh, this amendment. Uh, but there was also a lot of industry lobbying. Uh, and some of it was quite aggressive. And during that industry lobbying, that's when I realized, wait a second, I recognize these guys. A lot of these guys who are lobbying against my, C my boss's CFA amendment are the same guys that lobby against my boss's privacy bills. And when they lobby against my boss's privacy bills, they're constantly telling us that our bill will kill innovation. And, uh, um, it, and that brings me to the second point, which is that in Washington, powerful industry interests use the term, have basically hijacked that term, innovation, to push a non-regulatory and deregulatory agenda with respect to pretty much uh, um, every single form of new technology. Uh, so what am I talking about when I say that? I'm going to give you a couple examples. So. Um, uh, over the last year, there were facial recognition negotiations in Washington. Why were there facial recognition negotiations in Washington? Well, um, some of you guys may know this already, but in the last couple of years, facial recognition has gotten a lot better than it used to be. Uh, increasing, increasingly, there are tests showing that uh, algorithms at Google and Facebook uh, uh, are either approaching or surpassing human level accuracy in facial recognition. What does that mean? That means a computer will more accurately identify someone than a human. Uh, and that used to not be the case. Facial recognition used to be pretty, pretty shitty. Uh, that's no longer the case. And you can see how in a world of pervasive facial recognition, there might be some pretty cool things. So like you go to a coffee shop and it's a long line and you get to the front line and instead of being asked, you know, hey, uh, what do you want to order today? You're just handed 
your regular coffee just the way you like it, and you don't get, get out your wallet because you pay with your face. Uh, your face is on file, your credit card's on file, you know, that's great. You show up at a restaurant, uh, and you don't have to say, oh, I have a reservation, my name is, oh, nope, you're just shown to your table. Uh, a better example I don't have in here is you go to an ATM. And instead of two-factor authentication, which is what you have right now, you have something you have, which is a card, and you have something you know, which is your code, you have three-factor authentication. Your card, your code, your face. Um, still another cool example of how this might, facial recognition might be rolled out. Uh, let's say you go to the mall with uh, a, uh, an elderly relative or your child. Your child gets lost. Your father gets lost. Uh, you need to find them. Uh, perhaps you could give your, uh, uh, your relative's face, picture their face over to mall security and they could find them just like that. But you can also see how in a world of facial recognition, stuff could get bad really quickly. So, you know, imagine walking onto a car lot and before you said a single word to the salesman, they knew who you were, where you worked, roughly how much money you make, what your credit score was. Uh, or imagine uh, going to church. And uh, as you're sitting in the pews, uh, the cameras are scanning your faces and they're keeping track of who's coming to church a lot uh, so we can send a new appeal, you know, and who is, you know, sound asleep at home. And so we should send them a little email saying, hey, Mark, why weren't you at church this morning? Uh, uh, or imagine a world where you go to a bar and uh, some guy is looking at, you, uh, uh, looking at you across the bar and he can just whip out a smartphone and figure out uh, uh, your LinkedIn profile, see if you have any connections in common, uh, or pull up your online dating profile. Uh, I think a lot of folks would be uncomfortable with this world. And um, the reason uh, we have these negotiations is that this is not some crazy, distant, minority report future. This is today or the near future. So for example, uh, do you want to identify customers the moment they walk into your store? Well, you should look up a company called Face First. And this company, and this is a real company profiled by the New York Times, you can Google them right now, um, advertises the ability to identify VIPs, uh, suspected shoplifters, and my personal favorite, known litigious individuals the moment they set foot in your store. Real company. Uh, are you interested in tracking uh, you know, who's at church and who is not at church? You should hire a company called Churchix. Uh, this company actually keeps track of who is in the pews uh, so that you can like, improve your fundraising, uh, keep track of who's not going. The other thing they say is like, keep sex offenders out of church. Um, uh, uh, and so that's like a real company. And the, uh, uh, do you want to find strangers dating profiles? You should look up a company called Nametag. Now, I actually, let me say, I actually don't think this company can do what they claim to do. Um, but in a couple of years, they're going to be able to do it. Uh, and so uh, that is why uh, privacy advocates are so concerned with this. That's why uh, the administration, in the face of the inability to pass legislation, convened privacy advocates and industry folks in a room and said, you guys hash out best practices that companies will voluntarily agree to. This isn't even a law. These are just best practices. And uh, we will use that, at, you know, companies can sign up to that pledge and then we can enforce that against them. And so we were in this room, uh, we met about once a, every one or two months for about a year. And we finally, the rubber was finally meeting the road, we were negotiating. EFF was a part of these negotiations. So it was ACLU and basically most of the leading privacy organizations. And we got together beforehand and we said, okay, this is gonna be our, this is gonna be our proposal. Our proposal is gonna be that in general, in general, there will be exceptions, but in general, a company should get your permission before they use facial recognition to identify you by name. Uh, and so that was our ask. You know, we went into the meeting, we proposed, okay guys, this is our proposal. And, uh, and then all of the industry groups and all the companies who spoke up opposed it. Facebook opposed it, Microsoft actually opposed it. Um, various industry associations opposed it. And so then, uh, uh, we kind of thought that might happen, uh, but then we fell back on a different negotiating position, which was, okay, fine. Let's just go to this edge case. In an edge case where you're walking down a public street, you're not on anyone's private property, public street, should a company you've never heard of and have no relationship with have to ask your permission before using facial recognition to identify you? Can any of the companies and industry associations in this room agree that at least in this edge case, you should get permission from someone? And then after that was silence. Not a single company or trade association would agree that they should get 
your permission before using facial recognition to identify you by name. And at that point, all, not just like the sticklers, uh, uh, but all of the privacy advocates decided to withdraw from the negotiations. Uh, and in the rhetoric that was used against our position was, you know, we don't know what this technology is going to be used for. You know, we got to like maintain. And, and I don't think the words freedom to innovate was, were used, but I think the word innovation came up over and over and over and over again, that we were going to crush innovation with this voluntary code that companies would voluntarily, uh, voluntarily adhere to uh, in order to protect privacy. Now, here's the deep irony here, the deep, deep irony here. It's that the industry best practice when it comes to face recognition is to get your consent. So uh, uh, a couple years ago, Eric Schmidt gave a talk, and he identified face recognition as the lone technology that Google had developed. And once they developed it, like Frankenstein style, they've been like, oh my god, that's a bad idea. Uh, and they didn't roll it out, right? Uh, and so companies recognize that this is truly sensitive technology, and, and hence, most of the companies out there that use this technology actually get consumer consent. So Google gets consumer consent. Microsoft gets con uh, consumer consent on Xbox. Uh, two industry associations get consumer consent. Facial recognition companies uh, say, in general, you should get consent. There's a company called Kairos that came out and said this. Uh, uh, and so the problem is that large actors are not, some large actors are not getting consent. Um, and so these negotiations, which were really designed to produce what some would call a milk toast uh, 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 solution that is purely voluntary, relatively hard to enforce, failed. And the reason used against us, the privacy advocates, in putting it forward was the need to protect innovation. Uh, and so this is not some lone, uh, uh, some lone occurrence. This is just a symptom of a broader problem. Uh, in DC where industry lobbying has basically shut down Washington's ability to pass new consumer protection laws. It's not just stuff like this. There was another bill by Senator Rockefeller. Um, I don't know, how many of you guys are familiar with the data broker industry? Cool, okay. So for the rest of you guys, here's some bad news. So, um, uh, <laughs> so there are companies that um, uh, make, create lists and profiles of people by their medical affliction. They have literally lists of named individuals with Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, uh, lists of rural, um, uh, rural people who are low income, and they sell these lists under rural and barely making it. There is a list of Hispanics who may have a payday loan interest. There used to be lists of uh, uh, people with HIV, people who were gay or lesbian. These are actual real lists sold by actual real companies. And so Senator Rockefeller, who's no radical, uh, proposed a simple bill that said, okay, we have to have some rules here uh, for this, and we're, and we're gonna empower the FTC to issue these rules. Um, and a couple months later, after he introduced that, in Aspen, an industry lobbyist was asked, you know, what's the likelihood that this bill is gonna pass? And he held up his hand and said, I can count on the fingers of my hand how many members of Congress wanna regulate data brokers. And what he left out is that in the intervening months, his company had spent, and companies like it had spent millions upon millions of dollars lobbying Congress to oppose that law. So um, we haven't had a new consumer privacy law in, uh, out of Congress since 2009. And now I actually totally respect libertarians and I respect those of you in the audience who might think, all right, you know, damn right, you know, Congress doesn't know what the hell, is, uh, hell it's doing. I would prefer it that way. Instead of them mucking up all this stuff, passing a new CFA, I would prefer it that way. What's the problem? In lieu of Congress passing laws, states are passing their own privacy laws. I actually happen to like these privacy laws, but some of you may not, or some, uh, 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 certainly some companies are gonna find them to produce a patchwork uh, of state privacy laws. So to give you one example, Congress hasn't passed a single new privacy law since 2009. The state of California has passed 27 uh, in that same period. Uh, again, a lot of privacy advocates think this is a future and are very practical and are looking to states, but other folks might say, we probably want one law instead of 27, not 27 different laws, but 50 different laws. So um, uh, we need to fix this, and this is a really big problem. And uh, that's uh, uh, the last thing I want to tell you guys is that you guys are the solution, okay? Um, I absolutely love Jonathan's talk earlier. Um, I thought it was spot on. The one tweak I would make was to the part of his talk when he said, 
Can you believe that members of Congress sat in a room and wrote this? Why? Members of Congress, in general, members of Congress do not sit in rooms and draft laws. Their staffers do that. People who are just like you do that. People who are your age, who may be a little older, a little younger, uh, 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 do that. And the other thing is that there's, um, I, feel, I feel like listening to these wonderful conversations, there's this implicit those guys versus us. And, um, and there's this question of how are those guys getting this so wrong? There's no reason those guys shouldn't be you guys. And in fact, part of the problem is that those guys aren't you guys. And so uh, I urge you to do two things. I urge you to, it, you know, I think a good chunk of you guys are students, I urge you to take courses in policy work. Uh, so with, da uh, with Hal and Danny, the course we do, uh, we fly a bunch of Georgetown Law students up here to meet with you guys. Uh, then we meet via video conference for the rest of the semester. And then we fly you guys down to DC where you pitch your draft laws, privacy laws, they could be on facial recognition, they could be on revenge porn, they could be on uh, wearable technology, they could be on any number of things, uh, to actual legislators, to their staffs, to privacy advocates, to industry folks. Uh, and so, uh, uh, we, and I'm sure at MIT, I think Danny and Hal teach another course, Introduction to Policy. Um, explore these areas, and once you, ex so enroll for that course, explore those areas, and once you explore those areas, come to Washington, D.C. How can you come to Washington, D.C.? Uh, there's a new initiative called Tech Congress, which will actually place you in an office. There's an old initiative called AAAS Fellowships, uh, which will actually place you in a congressional office. Um, there's the Ford uh, Mozilla Open Web Fellows Program that will place you in an organization that does this kind of work. But I urge you to not see Washington as a problem that is ex external to the tools you have to fix it, uh, which is just a really wonky way of saying, you guys have to come down and inform these processes with your expertise. Um, so with that, I will close. That's it. I'm having so much fun tweeting you guys. I'm not sure that I can even keep up with moderating. Uh, that was three uh, phenomenally uh, provocative and helpful talks. And what we really wanted to do here was sort of complicate matters, get people to see just how rich and multi-layered these issues were before we start diving into the question of solving them. Before we move and make that pivot to Peter Super, who's going to solve everything for us, uh, I would love to uh, take a few questions uh, for any of the three remarkable folks on stage. And I knew hands would be shooting up, and so I'm going to get my post-lunch workout. <laughs> Remember, name first, then question. Thank you. I'm Charlie. I'm from Colombia, and I belong to the Berman Center right now. And uh, Wendy, I love your, your words and I feel me so identified and I remember uh, when I had to close my second startup in Colombia. Uh, and I had to close thanks to the, the tax reforms. It uh, was financially impossible to sustain something like that, uh, something like my, my tech startup. And uh, I remember the day when I was in the bank with, with the manager and uh, I made the maths and I said, Right now, it's the time where it's cheaper to close, pay to, the, to, the, to my employees, and pay to my organic uh, partner, that is the state and the tax departments of Colombia. So I said, right now, I have to pay the, the taxes and no profits for me, but it's OK. And then I said to myself, will be so wonderful to um, conceive the fail uh, the, the right of fail as a constitutional or, or as a civil right. Uh, if I will have a constitutional right to fail, to be in bankruptcy, uh, the state could protect me that right and could help me uh, uh, or help other entrepreneurs in the case that they go bankrupt. So it's in United States a right or a situation where entrepreneurs, and especially tech entrepreneurs that fail or go bankruptcy, uh, have the protection of the state. Because failing, it's important. And uh, it's thanks to fail that you discover the best ideas and the best services for humankind, in my personal opinion. 
Yeah, uh, th thank you for, for the, the, the question, and I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, that your experience um, was, was so challenging. Uh, there's an important aspect of, sort of balancing the incentives around um, uh, entrepreneurship. We need to give enough support to uh, those who try uh, to, to make it possible to fail uh, while not you know, enabling those who just set out to, to fleece the public and uh, to take money and with no intention of starting a business or helping anybody but themselves. Uh, and uh, the, the law in its uh, experimentation is trying to find uh, that point that uh, helps those who are trying to do uh, good business, trying to uh, experiment and uh, who may make mistakes along the way. Making a mistake should not be uh, punitive. Uh, and so, while I don't think there's quite a constitutional right um, in the United States, I, we have uh, taken more of the, the sense that uh, it, it's good business and good public uh, spiritedness to enable people to, to try and, uh, and fail and try again. Shahid Buttar, EFF. I have a question primarily for Alvaro. So in your capacity on the Hill and your time there, I imagined you saw a great many things, and there are two in particular I'm just going to invite you to reflect upon and feel free to expand <coughs> from there. Um, so as you were getting lobbied by industry, I'd love for you to share with others uh, to what degree you saw contrary interests represented on the Hill, whether through, like, for instance, can the groups muster even, you know, infinitesimally commensurate resistance without grassroots support and what does that look like? And then also um, activism by clicking and emails and petitions, if you can speak to the relative efficacy of those tools in conveying meaningful perspectives to legislators or any alternatives you'd recommend too from your time on the Hill. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a great question. So. Um, the bill I spent the most time on, um, in, uh, on in Congress was a, a, a bill called the Location Privacy Protection Act, uh, which tried to make it a rule that uh, a law, not a criminal law, uh, uh, but a law, that if you want to get someone's geolocation, you got to get their consent. And if uh, you want to share it, you got to get their consent. Uh, and that, by the way, is like the rules of being in the iOS uh, uh, in, in, in the Apple store, right? You have to actually sign and do that. That's their terms of service. Um, but anyways, um, we actually had a ton of consumer group support. We had CDT, um, uh, a variety of uh, other groups. And, um, but the industry lobbying was overwhelming. And then afterwards, um, I never thought, I don't know why I didn't think of it, but I never thought of uh, um, going and checking the public lobbying reports to see how exactly they stacked up. And I found out that in the two years where we introduced this bill, and then we did also, we pulled it out of committee, we passed it out of committee. So we took that step, which is actually somewhat rare. Um, in those two years, 61, it was like 64 companies had lobbied on the bill, and three of them were our supporters. Uh, and the remaining uh, 61 had total lobbying budgets, not just for us, but total lobbying budgets of $750 million. And our organizations had total lobbying budgets of $750,000. Um, and on consumer privacy, consumer versus the company, that is the norm. It is 100% the norm. Where you see, where, where we're making progress is on government privacy. It's, you know, spotty progress sometimes. It's not ideal progress. But that's where when the consumer groups, uh, where the privacy groups can align with the companies, that's when you get uh, uh, bills passed. But I, what you're basically seeing in DC right now is a bifurcation in your right to privacy. When it comes to your right to privacy against the government, yeah, you better believe it's not that great, but it's getting better. And Congress will pass these laws. And the courts will step in and invalidate overly aggressive surveillance programs. Not on the schedule we would all like, but they will eventually do it. On the consumer side, you're basically seeing paralysis. Um, you asked, you know, what are the effective methods? Um, I actually think, uh, 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 so letter writing campaigns, calls, calls the front desks are actually 
pretty powerful, uh, believe it or not. Um, usually every office will have a tally of what calls come in, and at the end of the day, you'll just get you know, a tally of those. Um, uh, Twitter is great, um, but nothing beats, nothing, nothing, nothing beats visits to the Hill and visits to state legislators' offices, uh, uh, to your Congress members' offices in the state, is what I'm trying to say. And so just nothing, nothing beats two feet on the ground. Actually, sorry, uh, uh, some things do beat it, like Pippa Sopa. That crushes it. Uh, but uh, good luck in trying to get you know, all the internet companies to align on a consumer privacy initiative. Um, so if you can't do that, go visit. And send flowers. That's always worked for me. Flowers do sending, win. Sending like flowers 100%. to a legislator's office with a note attached to it. A haiku. People actually yeah. pay attention to it. That's right. I, I have another question for you, Alvaro. Um, regarding your example of the person walking down the street and the, or the consent with their image, how would you write a rule that prohibited companies from using that public image for commercial purposes while not similarly inhibiting, for example, a news organization from filming B-roll footage or an amateur photographer from uh, publishing their work as art? Excellent. Um, so uh, two things. Um, first, I can't take your photo and use it to sell my products. That's already a law. Uh, that, that's, that's common law, and, and lawyers will correct me on, on, on this. The other lawyers in the room will correct me on this. But in general, I can't just sort of take your photo and be like, uh, um, I'm sorry, remind me your name? Nate. Nate, you know, Nate loves Cheerios, like buy Cheerios because Nate says so, unless I have your permission. So already that's, that's not cool. Um, uh, you asked the, the, the equally important question of how do you do that and not stop journalism? You do that in the following way. Um, the law doesn't prohibit recording. The law doesn't prohibit uh, photography. Those are your First Amendment rights. Uh, and, and I would not want to pass a law that does that. What you regulate is not even the generation of a face print, ideally, but its storage and enrollment in a database. So you actually shouldn't pass a law that says you can't do facial recognition unless you get consent. Why? Because you actually break facial recognition. So let's say the three of you guys, uh, uh, I have a photo of the three of you guys, and you, Nate, have opted in, but these guys have not. In order to figure out whether they've opted in, I need to do facial recognition uh, to generate your face prints and compare them to my library of opted in face prints. And so um, you need to have a provision of the law that allows for initial scans or that regulates the moment of storage. Uh, uh, of that face print. So I, th I, think, I think you can very neatly delineate between, uh, it's never neat, but you can delineate between photography and recording and generation of storage of face print. Hi, I'm Nathan Matias, um, a PhD student here at the lab. Uh, Wendy, you used this fascinating analogy of a thermostat, um, talking about, uh, like in this wider context of understanding problems as they're going on. And I know that that's probably an apt analogy for some of the work you've done, Carrie, over the years as well. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on either things you've done already um, to help monitor and understand problems like the ones we're talking about today and areas where you think that might be helpful. Uh, great, thanks, Nate. Um, so a goal of the, the Chilling Effects Project, um, where we have a database of legal threats that people have received, uh, either as individuals or as intermediaries and aggregators like search engines and blog sites, um, we post those with, uh, along with some legal questions and answers to help people see uh, the context in which uh, they're operating. So the fact of getting a lawyer's letter doesn't mean that you've done something wrong. It means that some lawyer someplace claims that you did something wrong, which can be very different. And uh, so our initial concept in the, the chilling effects was it's scary to get a lawyer letter. And uh, if your first thought is, yikes, I should pull down my website because a lawyer has told me so, um, 
And if you don't feel that you have the support to examine, was that lawyer correct? Does the law say what he or she said it does? Uh, is there a protection for my speech? Is it protected by the First Amendment or fair use? Uh, if you never have the opportunity to, to investigate that, uh, then uh, you've been silenced before there's any uh, chance for uh, uh, a judicial ruling or a challenge. So uh, to start with, we wanted to create a space for, for that exploration. And I am, you know, some people saw their, their letters posted and uh, saw analysis and found uh, legal assistance, went to uh, EFF or law school clinics or uh, other lawyers to, to find ways to challenge the takedowns that they'd received. Uh, other people, realized that they were in the wrong and uh, left their material uh, offline because, you know, while it's not the case that every receipt of a lawyer letter uh, means you're in the wrong, it's also not the case that everyone who receives a lawyer letter is uh, justified in challenging it. Uh, and so there are plenty of people uh, who recognized maybe that's uh, something that we really shouldn't be doing. And so just creating that sense of community and shared uh, bank of, of understanding uh, gives one uh, means of pushback, creating uh, the bank then for researchers to investigate the, the second level impacts of, uh, of the notice and takedown regime or of other forms of, uh, of silencing online expression, then gives in turn a mechanism by which researchers and journalists can pull on the data and go to Congress and go mm. to the, the congressional staffers and say, there's really a problem here. Your law meant to protect copyright against infringement is uh, in effect stopping political speech, stopping parodies and mashups, stopping the investigation of uh, computer problems. And you know, I, our hope is that with enough of that data, uh, we can help to push back against the lobbying and against the, the, the legal overreach. So um, I've got the mic and so I'm gonna ask a question. Uh, and the question is specifically for Carrie because she tied together something that Jonathan opened up with today with something that's very been, much been on my mind, which is the right to audit. Um, so Jonathan put forward this notion that freedom to innovate might include five different freedoms, and one of those freedoms is the ability uh, to try to audit and understand these systems. Uh, and I have to say, uh, as the formerly proud owner of a Volkswagen TDI diesel, uh, pretty much the only car that would get me 48 miles per gallon commuting from Western Massachusetts to here, I am now acutely aware of the importance of this right to audit and what we might end up doing with it. Um, we often spend a lot of time in this field sort of imagining what we would be like without certain pieces of legislation. So tomorrow, Corey's gonna ask us to imagine the world uh, without DMCA uh, 1201. Um, Carrie, I'm sort of wondering in your work, can you imagine what your work looks like with an affirmative right to audit? And then I'm gonna turn to the exemplary lawyers to your right to sort of think about whether that's ever actually a possibility. Well, I can imagine a spectrum. I mean, I smiled when I saw Wendy's thermostat photo because there's a researcher who's actually been studying people's mental models of thermostats. And <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with that work, but there's two basic models. So people didn't reverse engineer how a thermostat works. Um, so he did studies, looked at blog analyses and what people did, and came up, discovered that people had two basic models for how a thermostat worked. One was a switch model, whereby the temperature got below a certain point, the thermostat kicks on, it gets warmer. The other was a valve model, where if you put the thermostat higher, it's like a sink, more water comes out, more heat comes out. So he interviewed a bunch of people, he found out that their models were inconsistent, um, but what he also found was that even if you had the wrong model, you actually asked better questions and used the system better. And so as a first step, before we get full, you know, I, in our studies, we found that people don't want the exact knowledge of what's behind the hood. The Facebook algorithm probably has more than 100,000 features right now, and people don't want that. What people do want, however, is something like the thermostat, where they can poke and prod and check outcomes. So even like with the Volkswagen, the researchers saw the outcome of running tests on, on a highway versus, well, I don't think they had the exact lab environment, but they did have the highway. And so I think as a first step, what we really need 
and again, design is one way that we're approaching this, is a way for people to be able to poke and prod, whether it be their news feed, whether it be their you know, Experian number. I mean, there's so many algorithm, er, algorithmic, um, algorithmic, um, I, there's like clouds around us. I mean, we're surrounded by algorithms right now. They shape our world. Um, it's, there's even walls for me to figure out my tax, um, not my tax, but by my, um, what do you call the Experian number? I just blanked out on what that's called. Like, yeah, my credit score. Like there's, well, some companies you can get one free a year. Um, so you need to be able to poke and prod and to see how I can change something like this is, is really important. And I think the first step, um, the first step is to give people the mechanism to poke and prod. Because if I were Facebook and I gave you a, a dump of terabytes, that may not help you either. And so there's lots of interesting studies going on right now too about 23andMe data about what does that mean for people. And people really are coming together online to try to make sense of it together. And hopefully with people that are in the field, but also with people who have lots of data. So my first interface answer from the design point of view is that I would hope that we could come together with these big corporations and put in some of these prods that protects their intellectual property, but also gives us the outcomes and outputs that we need to be able to use these systems better. Uh, well, I, I've, I've drawn on Carrie's work in thinking about the role of, of feedback in the law. And, you know, in our traditional non tech oriented laws, there are all sorts of mechanisms for feedback. You know, judges see how precedents have been applied, how the law works in, in the past, and uh, adjust their rulings uh, to the outcomes that uh, they think the law warrants. Well, we need that as, as individuals experimenting with, with technology. And I think there needs to be a uh, sort of meta feedback that if the technology itself doesn't provide us with the opportunity to see inside, then we need uh, stronger regulation. So maybe those companies who are saying regulation interferes with innovation uh, should innovate to give you know, consumers the means to, to help themselves uh, before they find regulation smacked upon them. So I'm really curious how these exceptions are made in the laws that were described today, mm -hmm. because there's these broad laws, and then they're like, oh, and by the way, there is this exception. It's, it's, it's just us sitting down and you saying, well, we have these horticultural parties, and we don't want, you know, we're so crazy, like, we don't, we don't know what we're going to play. So, like, you know, we don't really want to plan for that. And then you have one guy who's like, don't worry, like, I'll take care of them. <laughs> and like, and there you go. Um, but um, I mean, that's literally how it happens. And there's like frequently lobbying involved and like donations and like, I'm not saying it's pay to play, but um, it's, it's the same way anything else gets done in this world through pressure and, and, and uh, whatnot. But um, I think it's entirely feasible to see a world where you have uh, exceptions to hacking and copyright laws for uh, uh, innovators and tinkerers and, and educators. And, and uh, this is Hal's idea. I won't take credit for it, but um, I don't know where Hal went. Um, I mean, I, I think you could probably uh, uh, like have like a horticultural hacking uh, uh, hackathon exception. I just, I just tacked on horticultural just because uh, I think it would be really easy, not, not easy, but feasible and uh, maybe eventually doable to carve out an exception to DMCA that when there is a hackathon sponsored by an accredited institution, educational institution, that you cannot charge anyone with a DMCA violation. Uh, um, and, then, and when people are like, what a crazy idea, like, uh, how, you know, you can't do that. And you'll be like, horticultural, agricultural, you know, uh, uh, parties can do it. Like, why can't we? And, uh, and then, you know, certain states could differentiate themselves by taking advantage of that, you know. And so uh, you could also get prosecu official prosecutorial guidance issued by uh, the Obama administration that says, you know, it's our policy to not prosecute security researchers who are, you know, white hat security researchers performing security research. Uh, security research, security research. You know, uh, uh, but, um, so I think, it's fe I think it's feasible. You just need pressure and you need mobilization and you need grassroots support. Uh, I had a, a question about the ACM's policies. I was really surprised to hear that. I'm a member of the ACM. I was very proud when I joined the ACM. And I just read their policies, and a bunch of them are really good, with the exception mm -hmm. of this one really dumb one that every single ACM member violates all the time. So I have a request to you, which is, would you write an op-ed for CACM 
who are, I just placed an op-ed with them. They're really good about this stuff, mm -hmm. telling them about this. And then if they don't do anything about it, I think we should all, all of us ACM members, because it encourages us to report members who violate the, the terms. <laughs> we should all tweet the ACM every time we violate a term of service and with our membership numbers. And, and report our own unprofessional <laughs> conduct, because what they're doing is making a nonsense out of really good principles by encouraging a really dumb one. No, I think that's brilliant. I think that's brilliant. It's, um, it's, it's also weird because just by being a member, even if you don't publish something, you're committed in er almost every other area of your life to follow these guidelines. <laughs> so um, can I say one, ask one more question? Yeah. Um, so, okay, so let's say I'm a researcher, yeah. um, and I would like a researcher exemption. To what, DOCA, to, to CFA. D, yeah, to Which CFAA. One? CFAA, what, okay. What, what do I do after I walk back to the table? Uh, I think CFA is a lot harder. Um, I think that their CFAA is, presents its, so I, I'm not saying it's impossible, I think it's harder. CFAA is the hacking law, right? And um, it's a criminal law, you know, and DMCA also has criminal penalties, I believe, um, but uh, I'm not a copyright guy. Uh, but um, CFAA, you know, sounds more like a criminal law, and so it's harder to get those exceptions. So are you saying what will you do, like, to get that amendment passed? Yes. Uh, so you would want to get, you know, break off chunks of industry to support you. You'd want to get some civil society groups to support you. You'd want to get a Republican and a Democrat uh, to take up the cause. You can't just make it like a, if it's like come, come, becomes a Democrat, you know, initiative, then it's going to die. Uh, same way it becomes a Republican initiative. But yeah, I mean, in the same way you pass any other law, you just need to line up your, your, your dominoes. Yeah. Hi. I'm Frank Lamani with the Student Press Law Center in Washington, D.C. I have a rant that I promise I will attempt to end in a question mark. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, in, in the line... In, in the line of work that, 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 that I do, um, we deal all the time with people who need access to high quality, reliable data from schools and colleges and who have a, a devil of a time getting it because it's all walled behind federal student confidentiality. I'm going to give you two recent examples of this. Um, if you ask the state of Ohio, I'd like a district by district breakdown on how many times children have brought guns into the public schools in Ohio, they will tell you you may not have that data because the number might be matchable to an individual kid. Somebody might know that in Calhoun County, Billy Smith was the one kid who brought the gun in and that number might match to Billy Smith. So they won't give you those numbers. You can't, you can't tell whether your, your child's district had one gun in it or 20 guns in it. The president of the University of Virginia was asked the other day about campus sexual assault and asked, uh, have you ever uh, ex expelled anybody from uh, the University of Virginia for raping somebody? And she said, yes, we have, but I can't tell you how often it has happened or how recently it has happened because all that is also protected by federal student confidentiality. So we don't know whether that, that number is one or 20. Um, it seems like there's an overriding public interest in knowing those numbers and a vanishingly small individual <laughs> privacy interest. And I'm just wondering, is there anything that can be done to bring some kind of sensible balance to this to where when there is a, 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 an, an overriding public interest in access and transparency and a microscopically small risk to the individual that disclosure can be had? So, so I think you need to amend either FERPA or the Privacy Act or both. So FERPA is the Federal Educational Records Privacy Act. It's actually due for an update, and this administration has said, not actually, but like I agree with you, it's, it's up for an update, and very you know, senior people in this administration think it's, it's time for an update. And so you probably know this already. I mean, you just, the time is ripe to try to get updates to that. I don't think it's Privacy Act, because it's not, it's, well, I'm not sure. I'm not a Privacy Act guy either. That's like its own little world. FERPA, okay, yeah. So that's what you need to do, and now is actually the time to do it. So. Unless anyone's got something else on that specific issue, I'm, I'm going to go to the last question. Hi, I'm Paula Villarreal from the ACLU of Massachusetts. Um, I was wondering, what's your take on open source? Like, uh, what do you see open source role on all this? To, to all of us. Okay. So, so, so perhaps to. Uh, 
maybe rephrasing a little bit, do, does open source solve any of these problems? Does open source play a role in sort of moving beyond these questions of auditability, uh, these questions of, of, of chilling effects sort of coming out of this, um, these questions around privacy, does that change the landscape if we had wider adoption of... Anyone want to give that one a try? Well, I love open source. <laughs> I, 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 I love it as a means of education and as a means of you know, uh, self-regulation. We, we can see into the code. We can uh, figure out how th things are working. We can learn from it and uh, build upon it. Uh, I think um, you know, it, it doesn't by itself um, solve uh, all the problems. Um, I mean that you, know, you can be chilled from from producing uh, code open or closed, but uh, at least by producing open source or free software, I'll say in case Richard Stallman is listening. Um, <laughs> but by by making your source code openly available, you are explicitly disavowing uh, the reliance on anti-circumvention and anti-reverse engineering provisions because you're inviting people to uh, reverse engineer and examine your code. So all of those things are renouncing at least some of the overriding, overbearing principles of law. And I think and that maybe I'll just add some of the licensing practices that people use around open source and free software are other good steps in those directions that you can attach terms that say, please share, and you can only reuse this if you share on similar terms. The GNU General Public License says, take it, share it, as long as you make your code equally free. Uh, and all of those are ways of opting out of the, uh, the, the, the copyright uh, sort of combine. So I'm going to close this out here. I, I want to thank um, these three remarkable individuals. So if we can thank Alvaro, Wendy, Kari. Uh, I found that just incredibly helpful, incredibly provocative. Lots and lots to chew on. We get a round of applause for all three.